Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to make a, just a couple of announcements um, before we get started with the talk, but uh, I really appreciate um, all of you being here and coming to this series. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I think we've taken kind of a wild ride around different disciplines and um, complex systems, so it's been really fun. Um, just a reminder um, for everybody that um, this is a very informal lecture series, um, and I encourage all the young researchers that during the end, during the Q&A, to ask questions both about the science, but also, you know, if you have questions sort of asking advice about um, research careers, um, please do ask the speaker about that. Um, we'll save questions until the end of the talk. Um, and you can, in the meantime, sort of chat in the chat box. Um, and if you, uh, during the Q&A, if you feel more comfortable, you can write your question in the chat or you can raise your hand um, virtually and um, unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, this is um, being recorded so that people who can't make it can see it later. Um, so if you don't want your face to be on the recording, you can turn off your camera and, and just ask questions in the, in the chat. Um, and yeah, so yeah, so thanks for being here. This is actually the last talk of the, the fall um, series and um, we'll be taking a little bit of a break and we'll be um, resuming back uh, in, the, in the lecture series in January um, with a talk by Timmit uh, Gebru and she'll be talking about <laughs> resuming, that's good, um, <laughs> with a talk about AI ethics and I'm really excited for that. Um, so look out for that when we come back from the holiday break. Um, and today we're really fortunate. So this is um, gonna be an awesome talk. And um, Chris is a, a scientist that I've really admired for a very long time. Um, and so we're really fortunate to have her here today. Uh, Chris is Simon Matsu she is a structural biologist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, my hometown, which is exciting. And um, <laughs> Uh, she'll be talking to us today about science for the next pandemic, from large scale simulations of genes to 3D reconstructions of chromosomes. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll, I'll hand the mic over to Carissa. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here for the complex system series. Um, I have a few connections in common with some people in the audience. I was uh, alumni of the Santa Fe uh, Institute Summer School from 1995. Um, and then that's where I really got interested in um, complex systems back when I was a graduate student. And also my mother, um, Joan Lovard Sematsu, I believe she was class of 1960 at uh, UVM. And she was oh, what? Uh, active. <laughs> uh, she had a show on the radio station and she was in the theater and uh, did lots of things there. So anyway, so it's exciting to be uh, speaking at her alumni uh, university. Okay, so I will share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the full slides? Yes. Okay, okay so, um, so I'm gonna talk about some work we're doing in Los Alamos about uh, modeling chromosome structures. And we're really focused on uh, the shape of chromosomes and how the shape of the chromosomes affects gene expression, uh, embryo development, and disease. And we have several approaches we're using. Uh, one is to do a very uh, holistic uh, molecular simulations of a, an entire chromosome, but using a very coarse grained uh, modeling technique. And then also we're doing some very large scale simulations, uh, atom for atom of smaller regions like a single gene of a chromosome. Uh, so in terms of uh, the, the influence of DNA shape and structure on gene expression, uh, there's sort of a fundamental paradox, which is that in, in all of your cells, uh, you have uh, DNA, uh, we call the, the complete ensemble of DNA in, in a single cell, the genome or the human genome. And the question is that in, in every cell, uh, each DNA genome has practically identical sequences uh, across all the cells in your body. However, the cells look dramatically different. So you can have muscle cells 
uh, brain cells, neurons, et cetera, all the different kinds of cells, they're uh, dramatically different in terms of their shape and morphology, the function, their role in the body and so forth. So how can it be if we believe that uh, all the information uh, to program the events of your cell resides in, in the genome, but it has identical sequence, how could they have such uh, tremendously different uh, morphologies and functions and so forth? Uh, well, one of the uh, fun, uh, one of the main answers to this question is that the genes are uh, turned on and off differently uh, as the embryo develops inside the womb. And, and this is called epigenetic programming. And so the idea is that once the egg is fertilized, um, it divides into two and those divide into two and so forth. And then at, at some point, uh, different decisions are made in each of those cells to turn some genes on and some genes off. And so somehow, the uh, DNA is able to sense its environment. Uh, so it senses where it is on, on the sphere of cells, uh, what, what is the uh, chemical makeup of the environment, um, what signals are coming in, it's sending signals out and so forth. And somehow that environment uh, uh, is, is critical in, in terms of uh, making the decisions for the fate of that cell. And so uh, uh, the answer to this question is uh, of how the same sequence could uh, result in dramatically different outcomes really lies in the shape of the DNA to a large extent. Uh, so you may have looked at um, schematics of the genome on the left-hand side, just kind of depicting the linear sequence of the DNA. Uh, but in fact, the DNA is a, is a very long uh, polymer. In, in fact, there's enough DNA in your body to wrap around uh, the moon uh, or the earth actually thousands of times. And so this DNA somehow is compacted uh, into your cells in a, a highly organized uh, manner. And so it folds into a very specific shape. And then the shape of the DNA can basically determine which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. This is a highly, highly simplistic uh, view, but I'm, I'm kind of pitching this to the non-chromatin aficionados in, in the audience. Um, so, so the basic idea is that you have your uh, genome, which is uh, 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 it's organized into 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome is basically a long uh, double-stranded uh, DNA molecule. And then this is uh, wound up kind of like a ball of spaghetti into your cell. And the way it's wound is uh, it's wound up with, with very high precision. So it's wound around these tiny uh, nanoscale spools that are called nucleosomes. And so these are shown here where you can see on the left the, the long uh, thin strand of DNA uh, winding around all these spools. There are thousands of spools on, on each chromosome. And on the right hand side in, on the upper panel, uh, we have an example of when a gene is turned on. So the idea is that when the spools unwind, the uh, chromosome gets sort of in a more open configuration. And then the genes are the sequences on the DNA and then the machinery needed to use that DNA uh, can glom onto the DNA if it's in an open state. If, it, if it's closed and condensed, uh, it's, it's harder for the machinery to, to get into those uh, stretches of uh, uh, promoter sequences and turn on the genes and so forth. Uh, so this is kind of the basic um, uh, picture people have in their mind when they're talking about how the shape of the DNA governs gene expression. And we basically call this epigenetics. Epigenetics is kind of uh, an umbrella term that describes uh, a lot of different phenomena, but this is one of the main tenets of epigenetics. And there's a lot of sort of um, circumstantial evidence uh, supporting this model that the expanded DNA results in high expression compact results in turning the expression off. But there, there's not a whole lot of smoking guns out there at, in, in atomic detail. Uh, uh, showing di direct correlations between uh, a compact 3D configuration and the gene turning off. So uh, our, our long-term goal is to figure out at the atomic level of detail uh, exactly what's happening in terms of DNA compaction and how that affects uh, gene regulation. Uh, and then, and this is another kind of uh, overview picture for epigenetics, uh, trying to describe uh, cellular differentiation in the embryo. And the idea again is when you have your fertilized egg, uh, as this is dividing into uh, two cells and the two into four, four into eight, eight into 16 and so forth, at some point, uh, these sort of uh, 
uh, stem cells or blank site cells, cells get uh, differentiated into different cell types. And then these, so it's kind of like you're uh, skiing down a, a mountain and then anyone who's um, been skiing much knows that you always come to sort of a fork in the trail where you can go right and you, you could go left and you're always trying to optimize what is the best one to go on, especially if you haven't skied that uh, resort before. Um, so you could go down, you know, a black diamond or a, a green slope. And so at some point you have to make a decision and then you may have to make more decisions as you go further and further. And this is what we call Waddington's epigenetic landscape where uh, when the cells are dividing and differentiating, uh, key decisions are made. So for example, for the brain, uh, your, your blank slate cell divides into uh, sort of a more and more specialized kind of neural uh, precursor uh, cell. And eventually they get very specialized into the specific kinds of neurons. Okay, so for example, you can end up with blood cells or brain cells and all the different kinds of cells. And then again, the, the concept is that uh, the different kinds of uh, factors in the cell that affect the shape of the DNA can control this uh, process. And uh, in addition to uh, development, there are many uh, applications in terms of DNA or chroma, we call it chromatin architecture or chromatin remodeling, but it's basically the shape of, of the DNA. Uh, and this, can, this plays a big role in many kinds of cancer, uh, also in intellectual uh, disability, uh, Rett syndrome, autism. Uh, there's, a, there's many, many uh, very direct applications to this kind of uh, research. And then here, we're looking at a more detailed view of some uh, chromatin. So we can see in the uh, red and uh, blue uh, double helical kind of spiraled molecule, this is the DNA. And then it wraps around these uh, teal colored uh, nucleosome proteins. Uh, and these are these kind of nanoscale uh, spools. And then uh, a, a lot of complicated behavior can happen. I was referring to the compaction, which is when you have, may have hundreds of the nucleosomes causing a condensation event. Uh, and, and usually this is triggered by lots of different uh, protein factors that are somehow sensing the environment and they somehow cause a collapse event, but no one knows quite the details of how that works. And then in addition, you can have a lot of other phenomena like the uh, DNA sliding along the spool or the spool sliding along the DNA, wrapping, unwrapping, the, the nucleosomes can get ejected all the way from the DNA. So there are all kinds of different uh, events that happened that contribute to the remodeling of the chromatin or the chromosome. Chromatin just means chromosome material. So it means the DNA plus the nucleosomes plus any other uh, junk that's stuck on there, other proteins and so forth. Okay, and then uh, I kind of was a little, um, uh, this talk is not really about COVID at all, but I've stuck it in the title to grab your attention. But uh, so this is kind of my one uh, chromatin or COVID slide, but we do have um, two projects uh, on uh, COVID-19 and chromosome structure, but we're just, these are, uh, we, we just started those uh, a month ago. Um, but where we're going with these projects is that uh, right now in terms of um, COVID, uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, like the, a lot of the scientific community is focused on um, the structure of the virus, uh, the structure of the receptors. Sorry, I have some cats uh, fighting um, the floor here, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, uh, just a second. Okay. <laughs> Usually they're very, very well behaved, but not today. I think they're rambunctious. Uh, but, but anyway, um, so a lot of the science community is focused on the structure of the virus and how it uh, binds to the receptors, how to block the virus and so forth. But there's a lot of more subtle effects about this infection that we really have no idea. Like why are some people more resilient than others to infection? Um, why are uh, older people more vulnerable? Why, why are certain people with certain blood types more resilient? Uh, why are some people uh, who have different um, genetic mutations more resilient and so forth? Uh, and so uh, a lot of things are pointing toward epigenetics. Um, epigenetics plays an important role in the immune system. Uh, often, uh, once, uh, the, uh, often once sort of like a, a traumatic event happens, uh, this can be sort of frozen into your uh, a genome in terms of uh, permanently altering the, the structure of the chromatin and that can be uh, persist for your whole lifetime sometimes. Uh, and so, uh, so we're interested in looking at how the uh, COVID-19 infection uh, alters the shape of your chromosomes, in particular the 
uh, how does it remodel chromatin? And there have been many studies on other viruses such as uh, herpes and hepatitis that show dramatic differences uh, between uh, a healthy and infected uh, host uh, in terms of the shape of the chromosomes. And so we're just starting our studies now looking at uh, COVID-19 infection and how that affects your uh, chromosomes. But as I said, we're, we just started this, uh, uh, we, we, we've been working on the grants for a few years and the project has started uh, uh, last month. Okay, so um, some other fundamental questions we're interested in are that after the Human Genome Project in the year 2000, which got the sequence of the genome, uh, there's still, we, we still have barely any understanding of how this is translated into what actually happens in the body. And so some of the uh, fundamental questions are, uh, why do different genes interact with each other? How do they interact with each other? So here are your, your genome uh, is this long polymer strand uh, that's uh, billions of uh, side chain units long, which are called bases. Uh, and you could have two genes that are very far away in linear sequence from each other, but they in interact. And you can have um, whole clusters of genes that interact to cause some kind of phenotype. And the question is, how does this happen and why does it happen? And it turns out that in, in many cases, we're seeing that if you look at the 3D structure of the chromosome, we see that these distantly positioned genes in sequence are almost touching each other in, in three-dimensional space. And so understanding the, the shape of the chromosome can really help understand the gene-gene interactions. Um, also, how does the chromos chromosome architecture influence regulation? Um, and then another question is, is there a chromosome structure at all? Uh, so if anyone familiar with uh, proteins and, and the protein uh, folding work that's been done, uh, proteins are also uh, polymer molecules. They also fold into different conformations. And then they have a often a very uh, clear function and they may have several different um, folds and they may transform from one fold to the other, but they may only have two folds or three folds. Uh, so it's a uh, very kind of uh, relatively easy to understand problem where you have this uh, polymer string, it folds into a very compact structure and that does its job. And you can look at the structure using X-ray crystallography or cryoelectron microscopy and you can image almost every atom in the protein and know exactly uh, what the shape is. Now for chromosomes, um, uh, right now there, there has been no images in 3D of a chromosome at atomic resolution. Uh, they're pretty much, uh, they're, they're very, very hard to look at. They're, they're much huger than a, a single protein. So a, a chromosome can have uh, millions and millions of side chains where a protein may only have a few hundred or a thousand side chains. So it's really an enormous task to try to image a chromosome atom for atom where the technology is just not there yet. And so people don't really have an idea as if, if a, a given chromosome folds into one structure or is it fully disordered? Is it sampling all around? Is it, uh, no, no one really knows if it freezes into one structure and samples a few other structures or is it just totally disordered but it has some kind of structural tendencies. Uh, so this is really not understood. And then, and since we don't really know if the chromosomes have clear cut specific structures, uh, we know even less about the so-called structure function or relationships in proteins. Often if you just look at a protein, uh, you can compare it to other proteins and get a good idea of what its function could be. And, but with chromosomes, uh, we, we don't really know much about the structures and we even know less about the structure function relationships. So these are kind of our, our long-term goals to try to provide more understanding on these things. Okay, so uh, in the talk, um, what I'm gonna present are um, some of the experimental data that we're modeling. Uh, we also do a lot of wet lab work, but for the chromatin stuff, we haven't done any wet lab work on chromatin yet. So we're working with a group at Harvard who does uh, exper uh, cell biology experiments uh, looking at uh, architectural data of the X chromosome and how X inactivation works in mice. And then I'll talk about our 3D models of the chromosomes. And then I'll talk about some of the latest stuff we're doing uh, in terms of using reaction diffusion, uh, particle-based simulations to look at uh, factors spreading around these 3D models of chromosomes. And then finally, I'll just touch on some of our large scale uh, supercomputing simulations we've done on just single genes. So for the uh, 
experimental work, uh, we're collaborating with Jeannie Lee's group at Harvard, who's been in the uh, X inactivation field for a very long time. And she's one of the leaders in terms of understanding X inactivation. And she's using a, te a technique called uh, high C uh, chromatin capture or high C for short. And so in high C, uh, the, the way it works is that uh, you have your cells and then the chromosomes are in the cells. And they're trying to get some information on the 3D architecture of each chromosome. And so what they end up doing is they try to go for these uh, contact maps. And, and from the protein folding community, these are used all the time in protein folding to get an understanding of the 3D structure of the protein. And it's basically a 2D diagram that shows the 3D structure. So for example, in the lower left here in panel B, uh, this is an example of a contact map. And so what we're looking at is on the x-axis is basically each position along chromosome 14. And then on the y-axis is also each position along chromosome 14. And then if there's an interaction, say between position 1,005 and position say 50,003, uh, that's denoted by a red, a, a red dot on that contact map. Uh, and then the darker the dot, the stronger the contact. So the idea is that contacts uh, that are between uh, locations on the genome that are close together in C 1D sequence space are kind of along the diagonal, whereas uh, things that are far away are on the off diagonal. And then the way these are determined are that you have your uh, cells and you add a cross-linking reagent uh, and this is basically like glue. And so it glues the chromosome together uh, all over the place. So suppose you have like uh, one of your, um, uh, like a very long uh, cord for, for your uh, cell phone charger or something. And suppose that cord was say a mile long and then you um, shove it into say your bathroom or something. And then you take a cannon of glue and then you uh, glue the whole thing and let it dry. Uh, then, uh, that frozen uh, structure of the cord would be what we have in these high C experiments. So uh, we have the sort of cord glued together in random places. Uh, then what happens is you then add uh, uh, these restriction enzymes. So this would be if somehow you could throw a bunch of uh, uh, scissors in there that would somehow cut, uh, cut, cut up the cord all over the place. Um, and then what, what you're left with are these um, pieces of DNA stuck together by the crosslinker. So this would be like with the cord, you'd have like two, two fragments of cord glued together and you'd have like hundreds of those uh, pairs of cord fragments glued together. Uh, then what you can do is you can ligate those. Uh, so you then you have the two fragments of cord glued together. You then uh, attach little other pieces of cord at, at the ends to make little tiny loops. Um, then what you can do is you can uh, purify and shear these loops to get rid of any, any junk that may be stuck to them, like other proteins and so forth. Uh, and then um, you can, in the end, you can actually sequence uh, all those little fragments. And what you know is that all the fragments that were um, stuck together and, and uh, form those loops, uh, these are uh, regions of the chromosome that interact with each other. So then uh, when you use high throughput sequencing equipment to uh, get all the sequences of all those fragments, you end up with a map um, giving you all the interactions uh, of the chromosome at that, at that snapshot in time under those conditions. Uh, and then these are averaged over thousands of cells because uh, there's, there's another technique of single cell uh, high C, but uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, bulk or regular high C. And so you end up with thousands of these uh, uh, cells, you, you end up with uh, chromatin material from thousands of the cells and where you get more crosslinks for a specific sequence, we believe that that means the contact is sort of stronger in the structure. And so I should say that these uh, 2D diagrams that are sort of a summary of the architecture of the chromosome are averaged over thousands of cells. So it's more of like sort of a overriding constraints that happen, uh, even though there's tremendous variation from cell to cell, these are kind of they, they could possibly be the more important interactions that take place on those chromosomes. Okay, so that's high C capture. And then, uh, so then this is just showing in a more schematic uh, look at these high C maps, 2D high C maps. And the, uh, another way to think of this is if you have, you have your uh, 
long polymer, the DNA. And then if you say you have a gene here and then it stretches out and loops around and then you may have a, another gene here uh, or maybe you have a regulatory element here and a gene here. Uh, so the high C technique can detect those uh, contacts in 3D. And then again, on the right-hand side, uh, the, the right-hand schematic the, what these high C maps are showing are the position along the chromosome, again, the position along the chromosome, and then the contacts uh, between positions on the chromosome. Okay, and so in terms of uh, Jeannie Lee's uh, research, she's focused on X chromosome inactivation in females. And so the idea here is that uh, in, in females, there are two X chromosomes, and one of the X chromosomes is actually inactivated in normal healthy females. So uh, it turns out that, you know, if both of our X chromosomes were uh, active, there'd actually be too much uh, gene activity happening. So you'd basically get a double dose of the proteins uh, coded for on those uh, chromosomes and you'd, ha you'd have too much and then the organism would die. It wouldn't be viable. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make it to birth or anything. Uh, so uh, what has to happen is that one of those X chromosomes has to be uh, completely shut down. And, uh, and the way that happens is not well understood at the atomistic level at all, uh, though it is well understood in terms of a lot of the function and which genes uh, are important and so forth. And then in terms of this picture of the calico cat, I'm not an expert on calico cats, but uh, what happens uh, as far as I understand is that um, during uh, embryo development as that ball of cells uh, as the cells in the ball of cells are differentiating, uh, there is a gene for the uh, color of fur. And in some cases, the decision can be made to uh, turn on or off the genes for uh, black and orange fur and so forth. And that uh, decision kind of gets frozen in uh, during development. And then as you get to the adult uh, calico cat on the, on the very far right-hand side, uh, it's, it has patches of orange and black fur all over it. And that gives you kind of a mapping of what happened in the early days of embryo development, where those that decision from uh, orange or black fur came in and how, when that got frozen in and then it gets stuck and then different patches of the fur got orange and some got uh, black and so forth. Okay, so this is some of uh, uh, some data from the Lee group. And so this is looking at high C maps uh, in, in mice uh, during X inactivation. And so on in panel A are uh, these uh, chromosomes, the X chromosome before they got shut off. These we call XA or the active X, active X chromosome. And then in panel B on the right-hand side are uh, high C maps for the, after the X chromosome got shut down. This is when the X chromosome is inactive. We call this the inactive X or XI. And so as you can see, um, so we have the active X and we see like a lot of uh, red along the diagonal and some kind of light red uh, off diagonal. And then what happens is when you um, shut off the X chromosome, you get a lot of these giant uh, red boxes forming. These are called uh, megadomains and these span almost half the chromosome. Uh, and so again, these off diagonal elements are where distant pieces of the genome in interact to, e to each other. And if it's, if it's cleanly in one box, it's basically sort of an isolated domain that doesn't really act, interact with the other boxes. Uh, so the, the main thing is that these mega domains form. And then she's also done all kinds of other uh, studies on the X chromosome. This one here is showing uh, a, knockout, a knockout of a, an architectural a protein called SMIDGE1. And so then this, uh, this she believes, uh, freezes uh, the process of X inactivation about halfway through inactivation. And then also you can look at uh, other things going on on the chromosome. So here uh, the, the current model of what happens for X inactivation is that there is a special RNA. Uh, this RNA is called EXIST or the X inactivation stimulated transcript. And the idea is that many copies of this RNA are being uh, produced by the X chromosome. Those go out into the cell, they're flying around, and then they come back, stick onto the chromosome, and then they shut the whole chromosome off somehow. So somehow they, they cover the full chromosome and they turn off almost all of the genes on that chromosome. There are some genes that still survive called the escapee genes, but the vast majority of genes are, are shut off. 
and she has a way to uh, basically pull down the RNA that's stuck to the X chromosome and, and examine exactly where it's stuck to. And that's shown in this 1D plot on the very, very top of this uh, figure. And you can see the, the up and down is basically where there's more or less uh, RNA stuck to the chromosome. This is exist binding to the chromosome. And then there's other, these so-called epigenetic marks. I won't be talking a whole lot about this in this talk, but the epigenetic marks are basically kind of the heart and soul of epigenetics. And so I showed you a lot of these um, cartoon diagrams where you have these hockey puck shaped uh, molecular spools, the nucleosomes. Those are made of eight proteins. Each of those proteins has these, uh, they're, they're, each of those proteins is a little polymer that folds up. And if it doesn't quite fold all the way, it has a little tail stuck on, on the end that didn't quite fold into that compact uh, hockey puck. And so you have eight tails sticking out of the hockey pucks. Uh, these are uh, really the key to regulating all the genes in epigenetics. And so when uh, certain side chains on those tails get chemically modified, uh, so here we're looking at a very famous one called um, H3, that's the histone three protein, K27, which is lysine number 27 on the tail. In ME3, it means it's trimethylated. Uh, and it turns out that when you see a lot of that signal, uh, it tends to uh, co coincide with uh, that gene getting turned off. Uh, and now it's, it's not really well understood how the turning off happens in, in atomic, atomistic detail. And that's the one thing that we're trying to go after. But in this talk, I'll mainly just be talking about the shape of the DNA and a little bit about how the RNA binds. Okay, so in terms of the, some of the uh, modeling work we're, we've been doing, uh, we're doing 3D modeling of the chromosomes together with um, Jeannie and also Anna LaPala, who really uh, spearheaded this whole uh, project and, um, and brought the technology to us and really has been driving this whole project forward and doing most of the work too, I should say. Um, so we're using Anna's models and uh, Jeannie's data to come up with the 3D configurations of the chromosomes. <clears throat> And so we use a technique called uh, molecular dynamic simulation. And so here is just showing uh, a little tiny uh, fret die in, in a box of water and, uh, and atom for atom. So the, the little gray balls are oxygens on the waters. And what you do is you basically try to come up with a model for a system, in this case, atom for atom. And then you move every atom in the, in the simulation forward according to Newton's equations of motion. You have a pairwise potential energy function. And for each atom, you calculate the force due to all the other atoms on that atom. You move to the next atom. You calculate the force due to all the other atoms on that atom. And then uh, you do that uh, maybe 100 million times uh, just to get a, a tiny amount of physiological time, maybe like a microsecond, or maybe if you're lucky, a, million, uh, a millisecond if you have a big supercomputer. And so this is kind of the basic concept of uh, molecular dynamics simulation. <clears throat> now, um, it turns out that if we wanted to simulate the full chromosome uh, in this manner with water and everything, uh, we would have to simulate over 100 trillion particles. And right now, there's nowhere near the amount of uh, CPUs. If you, even if you add up all the CPUs on Earth today, uh, we're, we're not close to that. Uh, and of course, quantum computers can't come close to do any kind of MD calculation, although they're still almost at the transistor stage of, of computing. Um, so it's right now, it's not feasible to do uh, all atom simulations of a full chromosome. But um, what we do instead is we uh, do uh, core screening. And so here we're doing very, very simplistic uh, models of the chromosome. And, just, and in this uh, data, uh, project I'll be presenting in this talk, uh, we're not really doing a lot of uh, look at, looking at the physics of transitions or anything. Uh, we're just trying to actually just visualize uh, these uh, 2D high C maps in 3D. And we're using molecular dynamics methods as a tool to visualize those uh, static 3D, or we're, we're coming up with a static model to try to represent uh, these uh, 2D high C maps, but in 3D. And so the way we do this is we, uh, start with sort of a random polymer uh, where uh, uh, Anna's using the lamps code and we start with the, the random polymer and we basically for for those high C maps in the case of Jeannie Lee's uh, X inactivation maps 
uh, there are 833 bins uh, for the, that high C data. So it's like an 833 by 833 contact map. And so we simplify uh, 160 million uh, side chain polymer down to just 833 beads. So it's a, a very simplistic model. Uh, and then what we do uh, after we have the random initial condition is we collapse it with a simple uh, Leonard Jones potential. And then uh, as we collapse it, uh, uh, Anna has this new uh, technique that, that's quite nice that uh, produces structures highly consistent with the high C. And so basically what she does is she uh, makes virtual uh, crosslinks on the chromosome. So she uh, basically has uh, you know, constraints uh, between different beads on the chromosome that are consistent with the uh, high C data. And then in addition to, to get even um, uh, better agreement, she, nowadays she's doing ensembles of say 100 different simulations and then uh, randomly sampling the high C map uh, to, to get an ensemble of uh, chromosomes such that when you add them up, you can get really good reproduction of the original experimental data. So, um, so this is some of uh, her results. So this is looking at the X chromosome in the active state. And here uh, it started with a random uh, polymer confirmation collapsed uh, with the LJ potential, but adding these constraints and we're able to get uh, 3D models of the chromosome that are pretty consistent with the high C map. So here on the left-hand side is the model of the chromosome. On the right-hand side is the high C map. Now this high C map is actually comparing experiment versus simulation. And so on the upper right triangle is the data from Jeannie Lee's lab. The lower, right, the lower left triangle is a, a simulated high C map made from this uh, structure you're seeing on the left. So we basically just look at all the contacts uh, that, are, that are made in this chromosome and then we plot them in a similar way uh, on a high C map. So we can try to compare the experiment in the upper right versus the simulation in the lower left. Okay, and so, uh, so we're, we're, we've uh, done the models for lots of different states, lots of different high C maps from uh, Lee's lab and we get nice agreement if you look at the upper right versus lower left uh, triangles. And uh, what we're uh, trying to track are the, first of all, how does the chromosome look in 3D? And then there's a lot of things that the cell biologists are interested in, in terms of architectural features of the chromosomes that change during X inactivation. And so one of these is, um, I, I won't go into detail because I'm already a little bit behind in the talk, but there are certain um, gene expression compartments that you can get by doing a principal component analysis on the high C map. And they call these A and B compartments. We're visualizing these in red and blue here. And this is the first time that these have been visualized in 3D in, in detail with direct mapping to, to high C. And we're also looking at uh, how the RNA spreads across the chromosome. And so here in red, uh, we're coloring the chromosome by uh, the positions on the chromosome that show experimentally to have RNA bound to them, and then how that progresses as a function of time, zero days, uh, three days, and then seven days as an X inactivation goes. And then on the bottom in the teal color, we have one of these famous epigenetic uh, marks or where they see the chemical modification on the chromosome and then how that chemical modification uh, ends up uh, happening across the whole chromosome. Okay, and then this is just a complicated visualization kind of superposing everything. Uh, and in and, and green, the green spheres are these escapee genes that, uh, that were, whereas almost all the genes on X get turned off, there's a few that escape. And we see these tend to have, be uh, near the surface of the chromosome, not in the middle of the core of the chromosome. Okay, so I'll quickly go through, there's two more topics, so I have to start cruising quickly. Uh, so. Uh, the next thing we, we are looking at, this is the latest research we're doing right now. It's ongoing research. We haven't published any of this. Uh, this is reaction diffusion simulations of factors that spread around the chromosome. And so here we're using uh, the ready to code, <clears throat> which is a particle based reaction diffusion code. And we're combining it with these molecular simulations of chromosomes. <clears throat> so in this case, we're showing uh, the new 
uh, newly spawned RNA particles in green. And so basically what happens is <clears throat> during in the chromosome's life, uh, the transcriptional machinery binds to the chromosome and starts making different RNAs. And in particular, it makes a lot of these green RNAs called the exist RNA. And the model is that these exist RNAs diffuse around and through the chromosome, and then they bind to very specific locations on the chromosome as shown from uh, experimental data, for example, Jeannie Lee's data, where they can map all the RNA binding sites. And so we're trying to emulate this process using these particle-based reaction diffusion simulations of these RNAs diffusing through and around the chromosome and then binding to the chromosome. <clears throat> and so uh, the way these are set up is that um, just like the 3D models of the chromosomes, we have our 833 bead polymer of the chromosome. And then also we're representing one RNA by just one uh, particle in the particle-based reaction diffusion simulations. We use a spherical boundary condition around the chromosome to kind of emulate crowding or, or basically confining the uh, localizing the RNA near the chromosome. <clears throat> and then the exist RNA particles uh, are transcribed at a given rate, they diffuse, and then they can bind. And so here um, we use a typical um, Langevin equation to do the diffusion. And then we have um, different chemical reactions that can occur during the simulation. So the ready 2 package is really unique in that most uh, molecular dynamics packages don't allow for chemical reactions to happen. So you can't really have uh, particles splitting apart, or like for example, a new, a new RNA being transcribed or um, multiple binding events changing the states of a particle, which happens in epigenetics. But this ready 2 package is really nice. And the way the binding uh, happens is that when two EDUC particles are inside a certain cutoff, um, they form an encounter. They form an encounter complex that can react with a certain probability. Okay, so that was the um, particle-based simulations, <clears throat> and then this is just some more details. But I'm getting way behind, so I need to skip through this. <clears throat> And so then again, this is showing uh, the end result uh, that we have the chromosome morphing or changing from the active configuration to the inactive. And at the same time, the RNA is diffusing around and then sticking to the chromosome. And as far as we know, we're the first uh, people in the chromatin field doing, doing anything like this, looking at uh, RNA particles diffusing around, around the chromosome. <clears throat> okay, so the last part of the talk is going to totally uh, shift gears and look at something completely different, which is uh, all atom simulation. So remember at the beginning of the talk, I showed that small fret uh, glowing dye in a little tiny box of water. Uh, these are called all atom simulations in water or all atom explicit solvent simulations. Uh, they're typically done, basically you have your uh, system of interest, like in that case, the little gl glowing fret dye and you put it in a box of a periodic box of water so that you have a, a box of water and then water is going out one side, it's periodic, they come in the other side. So you try to em emulate sort of an infinitely big uh, box of water and then you, you run those simulations. And so uh, we're, we're trying to do the biggest region of a chromosome that we could and uh, we were lucky enough to get a big chunk of time on the uh, Trinity supercomputer at Los Alamos. This has about a million uh, core processors and it's connected by a very expensive, I think the network itself is $100 million that connects all the processors, not to mention the computers themselves. So it's a very high speed uh, fiber optic network inside a giant warehouse. And then uh, we run our MD simulations on, on this cluster. And, the, and even given this thing, the biggest thing we could do is even less than one bead in our 833 bead uh, chromosome simulation. So inside one of those beads, or trying to see what happens. And that's basically the size of one gene. And so uh, uh, this is again showing some details of chromatin architecture, but the system we looked at is the GATA4 gene locus. Uh, this is important for, uh, this produces transcription factors. It has two zinc finger domains and it plays an important role in the development of stomach, uh, colon. It's related to stomach cancer and colon cancer. And so here, uh, in the end, we had an all atom uh, structure of that gene, but we made it uh, using coarse grain models because there's no 
uh, right now there's no experimental experimentally determined all atom structure of a gene. Uh, the technology is not there to, to get that. Um, so we took, uh, again, sort of a chromatin capture data and we used uh, a more complicated core screening technique to make a kind of scaffold of our structure. And this was done uh, in collaboration with Tamar Schlick at NYU, who's been doing core screen models of chromatin for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, so then again, similar to the bead models, we collapsed the core screen model consistent with the contact data to get the overall confirmation. Then what we do is we, uh, just flying through here, we thread this core screen model uh, with uh, all atom models of each uh, base and, and also with the nucleosomes. So we have sort of, sort of our uh, guiding overarching uh, pathway for the, the chromatin. And then we're able to thread that with all the side chains on the DNA and then and also put the, the uh, nucleosomes in the appropriate places. And so when we do that, we have our big model of the gene. So uh, this uh, had uh, 427 nucleosomes. It's about 83 kilobases long and it's, it composes one gene. And so by comparison, one of the larger systems being studied in molecular dynamics today is the ribosome. And that's this, the ribosome people used to think of as the biggest thing you could look at with MD simulation, but nowadays it's, it's quite small. And so this chromosome, chromatin simulation is, is much bigger at a billion atoms. And so this was the first uh, billion atom simulation that had been done. And we did this in collaboration with uh, Tamar Schlick's group at NYU uh, and with uh, Yuji Sugita's group in, at Riken uh, near Tokyo. And we use their new code Genesis, which scales very well on these supercomputers. And we also, at the time, the Trinity machine was just being uh, built. And so we work closely with the people writing the operating system at Cray and uh, Intel on this project. And then, so here is the uh, structure of uh, one, of the, one of the snapshots from our simulation. And so we can see uh, for the first time an, an atomistic view of what a gene uh, looks like. And again, this is just a model, so it's based on capture data, but you can get a feeling at least for what a crowded environment might look like, not only in the chromosome, but in, in a particular gene, and that the nucleosomes, there may be a lot of nucleosome, nucleosome interactions, a very complex electrostatic environment, and, and this complicated environment all comes into play when, somehow in producing a compaction or expansion event uh, these famous events that everyone's talking about in epigenetics that no one's really seen. Okay, so uh, just some performance data we saw in terms of supercomputing, we got great performance with the Genesis code. This is one of these speed up curves. So if you have 100 times more processors, it should go 100 times faster. And if, if your code is not very efficient, you won't see it go up at all. It might just go up a little bit and then fall over because uh, the code's spending so much time communicating and so forth. Uh, but with the Genesis code from Japan, we got really great uh, scaling to the, to the full cluster on this. And uh, so, so yeah, we ended up uh, pretty much exhausting the capabilities that Los Alamos had for supercomputing. And again, that was just inside one bead of these uh, chromosomes. And so if we wanted to do the full chromosome, we would need maybe 40,000 of those Trinity uh, machines. And so this is definitely a, a great system to look at in terms of the future of supercomputing, going to exascale, going to uh, everything beyond exascale. So I think in terms of supercomputing, these systems will be great to, to, to look at for, for many years to come. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, I started by saying how after the human genome, what is the next step? Well, it's to look at the 3D structure of the genome and how that influences gene expression. And we use these um, high C capture experiments from Jeannie Lee's lab in Harvard to try to make 3D uh, depictions of this experimental data to look to try to get new physical interpretations of the data. And then we're using this uh, new technique in terms of chromosome modeling reaction diffusion to look at how the RNA diffuses around the X chromosome and how it could shut it down. And then finally, we're using big supercomputers to do as much as we can on chromosome chromosome modeling. At this point, it's just one, one single gene. So I'd like to thank all the collaborators who worked on this, especially Jeannie Lee, Anna LaPala, uh, Yuji Sagita, and Tamar, and Changsheng Chung, and uh, the funding. 
And I just wanted to put up a picture of my mom who graduated, I believe in 1960 from UVM. And thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> thank you so much. I love that your mom went to UVM. That makes me so happy. <laughs> um, if, if folks want to um, ask questions and that if you open up the little chat box in Zoom, you can raise your hand. And um, I think Laurent had a, a first question. Uh, yes, so thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. Um, there's something that blew my mind, and I don't know if it's trivial for you. So I, I, I just want to go over what blew my mind because, you know, usually modeling, we know at what scale we need to think about our systems, right? If we look at a pandemic, we don't model individual like T cells in the host. If we look at Twitter, we don't model neurons. But here it doesn't seem obvious. Like you showed us. You know, simulations at the RNA particle level, you showed us uh, atomic, atomic simulations, which were just incredible. So my, my question is like, how does this all tie back together in your head? Like when you think about the impact of COVID on epigenetics, do you need, do you like gain something about atomic model of one gene, then you use that at another level, or do you need eventually to go and have an atomic model of the entire genome and its interactions? Um, I'm, yeah, how does it, Scale. Yeah, I mean, this is a great question, and it's really an important question uh, on many different levels. But I would say, in terms of planning your research strategy, this is like the the main thing you think about. And uh, nowadays, people are trying to do more and more multi-scale uh, strategies. So try to do as many different scales as you can. And I think there's so little known about these systems. It's totally different from, like. Uh, you know, modeling the atmosphere or something, or I, I don't know, that's a bad example, but anyways, it's not well understood, I should just say that. And uh, so we don't really know which scales are, are the most important, like on, for X inactivation, we know these compartments across the whole chromosome play, uh, we, we see them changing quite a bit during inactivation. We, we think they're quite important. So that would be the scale of the whole chromosome. And then, but to understand like, uh, the mechanism behind that, uh, you, you do pretty much need to go to the, to the atomistic scale. So it presents a big problem on how do you, how, we, we can't come close to doing a simulation of the whole chromosome at the atomistic scale. So we're basically trying to do um, the best we can. And then, and then uh, as I was saying, like for the 3D models, uh, at this point, we're not really trying to do any physics studies right now. We're just trying to do, um, uh, visualize that 2D data. So we're just trying to do the first 3D visualizations of the 2D, and then we chose just to have one bead per one piece of experimental data, the bin size on the high C map. So I, I'd say right now, we're just using practical considerations for the atomistic stuff. We're doing as big as we can. And then for the whole chromosome, we're just trying to do something simple in terms of a one-to-one -one correspondence with the data. So uh, basically, if, if we had more computing power, we, we could make intelligent decisions on what scales to use. But right now we're just trying to do, do what we can, I'd say. Lovely. Um, other questions? You can unmute yourself too, if you don't know how to raise your hand and that's fine too. <laughs> Jane, I think you have a question. Oh. Yeah, um, Carissa, thank you so much for sharing this. It's a really incredible and very complex topic. Um, I'm a data visualization artist. And so, of course, my question is about the, the visual rendering. Uh, I'm curious what kind of software you use for these 3D representations. And um, if you've made any like considerations to leveraging technologies from something like the game design industry to kind of attack some of the maybe issues with occlusion or um, transparency? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. So we, uh, uh, in the old days, we, I used to think a lot about visualization, but here I, uh, these things, things are so big, we didn't, we didn't have much time to work on visualization uh, yet. Um, so we are just using, uh, Visual Molecular Dynamics, the VMD package from uh, Champaign-Urbana. And uh, that, that's basically what we've been doing. They have a ray tracing uh, code in there called Tachyon, and we do an ambient occlusion uh, option uh, that helps make it look a little nicer. Uh, but we, yeah, we transparency is such a tough problem with most of the standard software in the field that it's like you just have to spend weeks and weeks tweaking, try, trial and error, you know, but we'd love to learn more, um, especially from the, the things from the gaming industry and, and so forth. So we really, we didn't 
re really do a whole lot here, but I, but uh, in my in a in in my the first field I was in in biology was ribosomes, which I'm still in now. But um, there uh, we really were doing a lot a lot more with um, visualization. But here here we we're just kind of starting. We, this data is really really new to us. I think. So. There's a question in the chat um, that asks um, what your thoughts on, are on um, how algorithms like AlphaFold might impact the field of chromosome structure. Okay, uh, uh, I'm trying to say something diplomatic because it's extremely controversial in the <laughs> Oh uh, no! Yeah. I'm really <laughs> outraged about the media and the press they're getting and everything. So, uh, but but I would say the protein. I'll just say the protein folding community in general. Um, uh, we uh, borrow almost all their stuff. So certainly in, in ribosome. So I, I'm, I'm very, I have to say I'm very new to the chromatin field. I've only been doing it like what, five, six years now. But um, for ribosomes there, I started in 2000, 2001. And I tried to really borrow a lot of technology from the protein folding community and use it for more functional studies like of ribosomes and molecular machines because uh, in, in molecular modeling in the biosciences, protein folding, by far, I would say, has been the leader, and they come up with almost all the new algorithms. You know, absolutely. And so, so we'll probably be drawing a lot more on uh, protein folding algorithms to to go more into detail on this analysis. Uh, yeah, we're we're really just in the very very early days of these uh, chromosome studies. So, but we look forward to using a lot of technology from the folding community. Maggie, sorry, I didn't see you raising your physical hand. You're up next. Uh, th that was really fascinating. Um, I was surprised on those escape genes that they weren't further on the periphery, you know? And I just wondered if you have any sense from looking at the structure why they are able to escape the inactivation. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's such a complicated um, question on how a gene gets turned off or, or escapes being turned off. And, you know, even though like these simulations show like like we have these this is just a computer model with these beads and when you look in the, the middle there's beads everywhere but each bead is representing 200 kilobases of the dna so there's lots of empty space you know so i would say that um even in the middle of the chromosome it, w it wouldn't surprise me to see a gene escape um but i would see like the tendency of the ones more in the interior to tend to be shut off the ones toward the outside to tend to be uh, turned on but yeah, to, to me, I don't think we know enough about the structure function relationships for escaping to, to say what we what what I would expect in terms of where it should be in terms of being right at the surface or a little bit down. Peter, does Pratchett have a question? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't really. He just wants I'm, I just wanted to add him to the situation. But I, I did what I did. I did. I did want um, so. Chris, that was a terrific, fantastic talk. I, I would, I would love to hear you say more about alpha fold, though, because you know protein folding is solved, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of controversy on the measure they used uh, and the the the, the so-called leap they made compared to uh, the the cast winners in the last two or three years. I, I think, um, of course, they have a lot more resources than any academic. Um, so right. they, did, they did a lot more machine learning. Uh, uh, I mean, they had a bigger training set. Uh, so, uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I, I work closely with Jose Onuchik, who's credited with the um, protein folding funnel. And, um, and he, he was saying that uh, uh, they're, they're using structure-based models uh, with covariance. So it's very similar to all the previous existing algorithms, but they just did it on a larger training set. Um, so I think a lot of people don't think it's a breakthrough, I'd say. But they, okay. but they have a massive publicity machine. They're one of the biggest advertisers on earth right now. And so this is really um, going to help them get a lot of uh, advertising dollars. I think that's the more cynical look that I'm <laughs> around the field right now. <laughs> it, it's different, but sort of the genome project, you know, the way that was framed early on was, you know, we're going to solve all the yeah, problems. And, yeah, and I, you know, just watching your talk today, it's like, so many scales, we don't know how all these things are like. We're still in that, that stage. But I remember sort of 10 years after that first sort of big media thing, like yeah, you know, get yeah, it. 10 years later, there's like, oh, actually this is really, we don't know. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, on that note, I mean, um, you know, it, it is, uh, uh, it's certainly um, new, a new 
you know, this is a good thing in that they're, they're really uh, putting machine learning center stage for protein folding, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and they are covering um, a lot of the protein uh, data bank, uh, the, the number of available proteins. But um, the, the things that it doesn't work on are like, there's a lot of these membrane proteins. And like, just because you have the crystal structure, uh, it's like you have a dead protein. You know, you see what a dead protein looks like but the proteins are, um, that they work by changing uh, massive changes in configuration. And many of them have, uh, many of the important ones have a lot of disordered regions. Um, so there, there's still a lot to be done. You know, they all work in complexes. So there, it's like multi-protein complexes. There's not much known about how those form and, and so forth. So there's still, I, I think it's a great analogy on the human genome project for sure. Just so one more quick thing. Uh, the you know, thinking about other areas, which so fluid mechanics, right? Fluids, complex system story. Yeah. It's sort of our great success, really, in some yeah. ways, because you could write down these equations. But that had separation of scale, so you could, you know, you yeah. could really yeah. go up. Yeah. And you know, you talked about this during this, but and, and Laurent, ref, you know, brought brought some more out. But it, this is just such. I mean, what's your sort of view of where this is going? It's so hard. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. What? But th this is why I love biology, though, because I, I started in plasma physics where we were doing fluid equations and particle simulations with fluid equations. So it's like, um, that's why I like biology, because it's such an open, wide open air. It's like mm -hmm. when you have a, uh, you get to the, you wake up early and you get to the mountain and you have fresh powder everywhere. <laughs> You're the first project, you know? This is how I feel about uh, many areas in the biosciences, especially chromosome structure, you know, so, so it's wide open. and But you're right, it's formidable. Like, there's important stuff going on at all scales, but uh, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. these questions on scales is causing me to think more about it because um I, I know for sure in physics this was so key to making a lot of yeah. the breakthroughs. So if we can somehow focus on the scale problem, I, th I think that's a great a great place to, to look. That was a that was a beautiful analogy. I like that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm cognizant that we're um, at the top of the hour, so um, I just want to thank you one more time. This was such a lovely talk, and it was just um, great to have you here. And I, I'm so glad that you got to honor your mom in this way. So that's really <laughs> well, cool too. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all. See you in late January. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, Todd. <laughs>